Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Tonight is chapter 10, which is all about sequence modeling and recurrent networks. Um, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward if you keep one thing in mind. And that one thing is that really we're not actually seeing anything new in this chapter. We're just looking at what happens when you take chapter six, which is all about forward propagation and back propagation in neural nets. And we're gonna look at what happens if some neural nets are built by repeating the same piece over and over and over again. Uh, but other than that, everything is still the same. We're just propagating forward and backward through a network. We happen to be uh, hitting the copy-paste button several times when we build that network. And we'll see that that gives it a few special properties where you can understand what it's doing a little bit better. We can uh, save on some computational expenses and we can get some better generalization at test time. So we can think of recurrent neural networks as being a kind of dynamical system. So a dynamical system is just anything that we might study in math or engineering where we describe the system with some state variable, we'll call S. So here S is a vector, and we have different discrete time steps. So we can look at the state of this vector at many different integer value points in time. We control the dynamics of this system, the, the description of how the system changes over time using a function f. At every time step, we apply the function f to the current state, and the output of that function gives us a new state. So when we know what the world is like right now at time t, we can figure out what the world will be like at time t plus one by applying the function f to the time step right now. And if we apply f several times, we move several time steps forward. There is one big assumption that's underlying this model of the world. And that assumption is that the way the world works doesn't change. This is the same kind of assumption that we have throughout basically all of science. You can think of science as the assumption that the rules of the universe stay the same over time. And so if we do an experiment on Thursday, we'll learn something about the rules of the universe and then we can go and apply those rules on Monday next week and the rules of the universe will still be the same. You could also imagine other worlds, and in math we often do imagine other worlds where all the rules change arbitrarily from one day to the next, but then you wouldn't really be able to do any science and you wouldn't really be able to do any machine learning. The recurrent nets are just a way of formalizing this idea of a dynamical system that is updated in discrete steps over time. To train a recurrent net, we need to have a way of taking this idea of variables that are updated in a recurrent fashion and turning it into the neural network architectures that we're used to so that we can apply standard forward propagation and back propagation algorithms. On the left of this graph, I show you one way of thinking of a recurrent network, which is a variable that actually influences itself. If we have some input x that updates some set of hidden representation values h, and h continuously evolves and influences future values of h, we can draw that with an arrow that loops around from h back to itself. We represent that it's a recurrent connection where a variable is influencing itself by including a black box inside the arrow. We can take this and turn it into a more traditional neural net that doesn't have any black boxes and looping arrows, that just has a finite number of forward prop and back prop steps by doing what we call unfolding or unrolling the graph. The way this works is we choose a number of time steps that we're going to unfold the graph. Uh, here, I've drawn three of them explicitly. And we just take the edges that are present in the recurrent graph on the left, and we copy those edges onto instantiations of each of the variables at different steps in time. So if we have a value of x and h at t minus one, we copy the arrow going from x to h, and then we see that there's an arrow from h to itself in the graph on the left with a black box. So we represent that by adding an arrow from h at t minus one to the new value of h at time h of t. So you can think of h as a single variable representing some meaning, like representing latent variables describing the input x that influences itself. Or you can think of there as being two different variables, h of t minus one and h of t, 
that each have only one value rather than changing value. In this view of h of t and h of t minus 1 as having immutable values, h of t has a value that is fully determined by the value of h of t minus 1. Most recurrent networks that we train for actual practical purposes, like processing sentences, have hidden units in them. And most of the recurrence happens inside those hidden units. We can think of the hidden units as being a little bit like a memory. As you read the input and you see different words, you update the values of the hidden units. And the hidden units are also influenced by their own value at the previous time step. So once information goes into those hidden units, they can continue influencing the future states of those hidden units. We might at some very early time t, like x of t minus 1, see a word that influences h of t minus 1. And then that can influence h of t, and then that can influence h of t plus 1. So at h of t plus 1, we actually have information about what x of t minus 1 was. And we can use that information when we make predictions for the output, o of t plus 1. When we train these networks, there's a lot of different ways that we can impose losses on the output. A lot of the time what we do is we have different labels that we would like to predict at every time step. And we compare the output at that time step to the desired label and compute a loss that we can add up later and backpropagate the gradients of that loss. Some special kinds of neural networks can give us extra efficient backpropagation graphs. If you think about what happens when we have recurrence through the hidden units, let's trace what happens as we do backpropagation from the loss at time t plus 1. We have to follow all of the arrows in the graph backwards until we come to every occurrence of the parameters we want to learn. So let's say we want to learn the parameters w. If we start at the loss l of t plus 1, we have to follow the arrow backwards to the output at o of t plus 1, and then we have to follow the ba arrow backwards again to h of t plus 1. And at that point, we're very near one use of w, where we go from h of t to h of t plus 1. So we could backpropagate to that value of w. But we're not actually done there. We have to keep flowing further back through the graph until we've hit every instance of w, so that we compute the gradient on all the different ways that w is used. That means we need to step through time and visit h of t and h of t minus 1. A procedure is called the backpropagation through time algorithm. It's really just the backpropagation algorithm applied to one of these unfolded computational graphs. And this is one of the reasons that recurrent networks can be more expensive to train than other kinds of networks. You need to actually store the activation values for all the different time steps, and you need to spend the time to backpropagate through all of these time steps. Some special structures of recurrent networks, where the recurrence happens only through their outputs, make it easier to train the network without having as much of a computational cost. So what does it look like if we have a recurrent net where the recurrence happens only through the output? At each time step, we get an input x, and we produce a hidden representation h, and we produce an output o. If we're looking at a text sequence, we could imagine maybe we're predicting the next word after x. We're predicting the word that happens at x t plus 1. Um, and in this case, the output, the word that we predict, is fed back into the model to help predict the next word later on. But we don't actually have any arrows going from the hidden representation h of t minus 1 to h of t. The reason that this kind of model is interesting is that we can get away without running the backpropagation through time algorithm. Um, instead, we can use a technique called teacher forcing that I'll describe in a few minutes. Another interesting class of recurrent networks is when we have a sequence as an input and we produce only one value as an output. So you can imagine that you could do something like read a sequence of words and then say something about the meaning of the sentence rather than trying to predict some output word for every single input word that we see. One way that we often use this kind of model is if we want to read a review on a website. Like we can read an Amazon review of a product and we can understand whether that review is saying positive things or negative things about the sentence that we just read. So the teacher forcing algorithm lets us train the version of the network where the recurrence is only through the outputs. 
The basic idea is that during training, we can use the actual labels for the output from the training data as the input to each time step instead of using the network's own output. This algorithm is called teacher forcing, and the basic idea is when we want to get the influence of the previous time step on h of t, we look to the label y of t minus 1 rather than looking to the o of t minus 1 for the previous time step. Because we do that, and y of t minus 1 is fixed, it doesn't change as a function of anything else, there's no arrows flowing into it, the backpropagation algorithm stops when it reaches the y of t minus 1s. And that means that we can actually parallelize the model across all the different steps. Uh, it doesn't need to explicitly trace its way back through all of them, and it can be much more efficient. At test time, we then go ahead and feed the output from each time step into the hidden units for the next time step. There are some drawbacks to teacher forcing. One issue is that a lot of the time the network starts to behave very differently when you generate random samples from the model. So if we train a neural net to predict natural language sentences, like we train it on English sentences and tell it after reading each word to predict the next word, at training time, it only ever sees real English sentences. And it's always conditioning on perfectly valid words every time it's predicting the next word. Uh, when we then start to run it at test time, it might generate an unusual word or an unusual phrase early in the sentence. And now you're conditioning on that unusual phrase when you go to predict the next word. Because the phrase that you're conditioning on is unusual, the model hasn't trained on it very well. And it might start to predict more and more unusual predictions and wander further away from realistic sentences as it moves into the future. So that's one reason that there are some alternative algorithms uh, that I won't cover here, but you can read about in conference papers. Uh, there's one called Schedule Sampling, developed by Sammy Bengio and other people at Google Brain. In Scheduled Sampling, the model is trained to predict a few words ahead in the future, so it has to actually generate a few steps on its own, and it's less prone to wander. Um, there's another algorithm called Professor Forcing, where the hidden units are regularized to appear as normal as possible when it's in pre-generation mode. Uh, and these are basic extensions to the teacher forcing algorithm that can solve this problem that teacher forcing often results in strange behavior when you start to sample from the model. Um, one way that we often see sequences is if we have a fully connected graphical model. Uh, so if we have a graphical model that represents a joint probability distribution over some vector value y, we can decompose this into several different conditional distributions, where we begin with a simple distribution over y1, and then predict y2 given y1, and then y3 given y2 and y1, and so on. If you wanted to actually represent all of the different possible relationships between every member of y, it's possible to do so with this graphical model, where we actually draw all of the edges. But that means that if we have an n-dimensional vector, we have um, an, an explosion that just expands combinatorially with the value of n in the number of different interactions we need to model. And it, it becomes exponentially difficult to store the description of the model, and it becomes um, inefficient statistically to try to gather an exponential amount of data to fit all of these different connection values. So just representing every possible relationship between every possible variable is not necessarily a good idea. That's where recurrent nets come in. Instead of representing every relationship between every possible variable, we organize the variables according to time, and we say that there's a single update rule that moves us from each time step to the next. It means that we represent the correlation between one time step and the next time step, but we don't bother to directly represent the correlation between time step one and time step 10. Uh, instead of trying to explicitly parameterize the relationship between time step one and time step 10, we just represent the correlation between time step one and time step two, and then use that same, represent, that same relationship to get us from time step one to two, apply it again to get from time step two to time step three, and so on until we've reached time step 10. So learning a single time step update rule tells us a lot about how to 
traverse long gaps in time without having to explicitly represent all of those relationships that bridge the very long gaps. It means that we can restrict ourselves to learning a finite amount of relationships between variables and then apply that finite set of relationships to extend out to possibly infinitely long sequences without having to explicitly represent all of those different variables. So these are of course simplifying assumptions. The assumptions are not always necessarily true. If there really is some interesting pattern where uh, two time steps a hundred uh, time units apart are related in some interesting way, then this model would actually miss out on capturing that subtlety. But for most of life, it's very reasonable to assume that uh, one time step influences the next, and you can ignore what happened before the previous time step, as long as you've stored sufficient information about the state of the world in your hidden unit vector h. So you can use the hidden unit vector h as a kind of catch-all memory, where the model learns to store everything you need to know about the previous state of the world so that you can factor your representation of the world into this um, one time step update rule. That, uh, for example, if at time step one you hear that the reading group is at 6.30 p.m. tonight, you can store that information in your hidden unit, H. And then you continue to update H by copying that information from one time step to the next. It means that in the afternoon, you still remember that the reading group is at 6.30 p.m. So then at 6.25 p.m., when you're trying to predict what will happen at 6.30, you have this information in your hidden unit vector, and you can predict that the reading group is about to start. You don't need to predict that from first principles by observing your pixels at 6.25 p.m. You can read it out of your hidden unit memory state that you've used to summarize everything relevant that happened in the earlier time steps you saw earlier that day. Yeah. Um, the number of hidden units stays the same regardless of how long the sequence gets. So let's say that you have um, 100 hidden units and you have, uh, like, let's say 100 visible units. You now learn this matrix that goes from the input with 100 units to the hidden units that also has 100 units. So that matrix is 100 by 100. You've got uh, 10,000 parameters in there. Um, and then you need to learn another matrix that takes you from the hidden units at time t to the hidden units at time t plus 1. That's also 100 by 100. And so you've got another 10,000 parameter matrix. Overall, you've got about 20,000 parameters. And that will get you through your whole day. Uh, you can keep applying your same 100 by 100 update matrix over and over again to keep updating the state of your memory every time you see something new. Um, if you wanted to learn the relationship between time one and time 100, and also everything in between, you would need to keep learning a different 100 by 100 matrix for every unique time step. Um, it would be like you don't know that the rules of how the world updates are always the same at every time step. Um, like, if you learned that if somebody tells you the reading group is at 6.30, you would know that that applied to 6.30 p.m. But if somebody told you the reading group is at 7.30 p.m., you would have to separately get training examples where you would learn the relationship between hearing something about the time 7.30 and then seeing events happen at 7.30 p.m. You wouldn't get to have this sharing of information that all the different time steps have the same update rule. Does that make more sense? It does. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an abstract concept. It can be hard to know how well I've explained it. No, that's yeah. great. Okay, thank you. Um, so another kind of model that we see sometimes is a vector to sequence model. So the idea is we'll have an input X, that's a vector, and at every time step, we'll apply some matrix that translates from X to some hidden unit vector. But that hidden unit vector will also be updated by the hidden unit vector at a previous time step. It means that we can take a vector and unpack it into a sequence of whatever length we need. Uh, 
one of the main ways that we use this is if X is some kind of abstract neural representation and we want to decode it into a sequence that a human can understand. Um, so if X is a latent variable in some kind of generative model, we can turn that representation X into an actual sentence of real words that a human can understand. Uh, we'll see how we use this for sequence to sequence models pretty soon. It's pretty rare to see a vector to sequence model on its own. I guess one way that you could see it is an image captioning model. If you see an image that has a fixed size, you can generate as many words as you want to explain what's happening in that image. That would probably be the main way that we actually see vector to sequence models in practical applications without any other kind of neural net component attached to them. Yeah, you have a question over there. Would R represent a fixed or er, a calibratable but applies uh, the same set of parameters applied? Across? Applied the same time, the same over and over again, yeah. Um, and you know, here we're representing that as just like one matrix multiply. You could imagine sticking any kind of function in there, like it could be a continent that you run over and over again. The other thing is the way that we draw this in the graph, it kind of looks like you keep applying R over and over and over again. Um, that's the simplest way to draw it so that you can understand how the influence flows from X to the different hidden units. When you actually implement this, you can multiply R by X once and store that RX value and then keep applying that to all the different hidden units without having to explicitly recompute it every time. Because the value of X isn't changing, it's always the same X, so there's no need to recompute RX. Well, can R potentially be cal uh, calibrated? Oh yeah, so so you could also you could also make R be a function of like h of t minus one or something like that if you want, and then the graph that you backpropagate through would be deeper. But that's also perfectly feasible. Yeah. Uh, so this this is basically just a tool that lets us take a single vector and unpack it into a sequence of of our desired size. In general, you can think of deep learning as a way of representing differentiable functions that map from one kind of variable to another kind of variable. So in chapter six, we saw all about taking a vector and turning it into another vector or turning it into a floating point number. Recurrent nets are really just a way of bringing sequences into the equation. Uh, you can take a sequence and turn it into another sequence. You can take a vector and turn it into a sequence. You can take a sequence and turn it into a vector. And, and it just means that we have all these different kinds of problems that we can solve with the same backpropagation techniques as we use for vector to vector. Um, a lot of recurrent models uh, use recurrence through both the output and the hidden units. And that's pretty straightforward. It really just means that your memory at one time step is influenced both by your memory at the previous time step, so you remember the things that you already knew, and it also gets updated based on the output that you have at the previous time step. And this means that your model is just more flexible. It means your future decisions can be influenced by your current decisions. If you have something like a language model of text, it means that when you randomly choose the words at each time step, the random choice you make will go ahead and influence the words that you make at the future time steps. So this can represent basically any probability distribution over the Y variables. Um, as long as the y's at each time step depend only on the x's that come from earlier time steps. Uh, we also often use bidirectional RNNs. So we have some layers where uh, one time step influences, the hidden units at one time step influence themselves at future time steps, and we have other hidden units that influence themselves in the past. That sounds kind of crazy, right? Like, how can you have information flow to the past? So clearly we can't actually run this on something like a robot or a self-driving car that's actually out behaving in real time. You can't uh, update your driving decisions based on something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, at, at least, you know, not yet, maybe with more research into tachyons or something. Um, the way that you use these kinds of models is when you're processing data that's stored offline. So like, let's say that you have a video that's been updated to, uploaded to YouTube. You want to process that video and annotate it and you know, describe the different actions that are happening in the video. In that case, because you've actually got the video stored on disk and it's not happening live in real time, you can use uh, context from later in the video to inform your opinion of what's happening earlier in the video. A lot of the time we find that for things like language models where we want to understand the meaning of a sentence, 
these kinds of bidirectional models often get a much better idea of what's happening in the sentence than if we force the model to respect causality and process it one word at a time. Um, I, I notice my own brain working this way when I, I read a page of a book, that a lot of the time I'm kind of skimming and maybe I don't get the full idea, and then I see something interesting low on the page, and it makes me reevaluate what I was reading in the previous paragraph, and then I go back and reread it. So you can think at a high level that this is kind of a mechanism for letting the recurrent that do that. It actually takes information from later in the sequence and brings it back to reevaluate the way that it thinks about something that came earlier in the sequence. From the point of view of training this with backpropagation, it's really still just an unrolled graph. You really just look at the losses that are applied at each time step and follow the arrows backwards until you've computed derivatives on all of the relevant parameters. One of the fanciest kinds of recurrent networks we can build is what's called the sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture. This was developed by people like Ilya Setskiver and Oriol Vignoles and some of their collaborators at Google Brain a few years back. The basic idea is you have a uh, sequence to vector recurrent network that reads some input sequence and summarizes it with a fixed length vector. And then you have a vector to sequence neural net that takes that vector and decodes it into a sequence. So you can have something like a French sentence at the input and you summarize that French sentence with a vector that is an abstract representation of the meaning of the French sentence. And then you can decode that vector into an English sentence that actually contains all their words that give you the translation that you need of, of the French sentence. You can train this like any other deep learning model using supervised learning. If you have examples of the input sequence, like examples of French words, and you have examples of the output sequence, like examples of English words for the same sentence, you can just train the model to maximize the probability of outputting the English sentence when you load the French sentence in the input. And we have training data for that because a lot of different governments around the world translate a lot of their proceedings into different languages. So you can get transcriptions of speeches in Canadian Parliament in both English and French, and you know which English sentence goes with which French sentence. So it's very straightforward to go and train these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models to replicate that kind of mapping. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are all the Ys receiving the same context? All the Ys are receiving the same context, yeah. So that, that context influences the hidden unit vectors, the ones that are drawn with little empty circles here. And those hidden unit vectors from each time step influence each other so that as you move through the output sequence, you get uh, different hidden units at each time step and you decode to different words at each time step. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting with translation models is that because so much of the training data comes from political speeches, you often find that you uh, mistake very generic words, you know, like my compatriots uh, for people from the same country as you. Uh, so, for example, when Macron was uh, doing a speech recently, there was a translation model where he said, uh, mes chers compatriotes in French, you know, my, my dear compatriots, and it was translated to English as my fellow Americans, even though he was addressing French people. That, that's uh, an example of the kind of, of bias that you can see when you have a very specific way of collecting a large amount of your training data and the way that it can end up confusing a machine learning algorithm in practice. Uh, so far I've mostly described shallow recurrent networks where we have an input x and we multiply some matrix to get our hidden unit values and then those hidden units are directly connected to themselves at the next time step. But you can also make deep recurrent nets. There's several different ways to do this. Um, on the left, I show you how you can have uh, two different layers of hidden units where within a time step, the first layer influences the second layer. And then each of these hidden layers influences the future version of itself. Um, another thing that you can do in the middle of this plot is you can actually have hidden units that go through a few steps before they update themselves. So you can have some intermediate computations before you influence the future version of the hidden unit using itself. Uh, and then 
it's also possible to do things like combine steps that go straight from influencing the next time step, but also incorporate some influence that's based on intermediate functions. A few years ago, we used to hear a lot about recursive networks. We don't hear quite as much about them. Yeah. Can you repeat um, the difference between recurrent net and your shallow recurrent net? Is it the network updates itself? Oh, well, so a, a shallow recurrent network would have um, a connection directly from the input to the hidden units, uh, a connection directly from the hidden units to their value at the next time step, or a connection directly from the hidden units to the output. Uh, you can make all of those deeper by turning each of those connections into multiple steps. Like you could imagine, maybe you're making a model of a video and you could have something like a convolutional net with several layers that reads the input image from one frame of the video and goes through several convolutional layers before it outputs the hidden units for that time step. Um, you could also imagine having a deep network that computes the new value of the hidden units given the current value of the hidden units. Or when you make output at every time step, you could imagine having a deep network that computes the output given the hidden units at a time step. Basically, all of these connections that so far I've been describing as just one matrix multiplication to make the drawing simple, each of those matrix multiplies can be turned into a deep net. And, and those are all different ways of making the recurrent net deeper. Very welcome. Uh, so far, we've mostly been talking about things that we call recurrent networks. Um, there's another kind of network that people usually call a recursive network. And there's a big semantic debate about which things are recurrent and which things are recursive. And are these words synonyms, or is one a subset of the other, and so on. But I, I won't wade into that a whole lot. Um, in this chapter, we use recursive network to refer to networks that have tree structures where they merge information in a sequence. So we've used recurrent network to refer to moving through a sequence left to right and updating a hidden memory cell by uh, conveying information from that cell from one time step to the next every time we do an update. Another way that you can imagine processing a sequence of variable length is you could take neighboring steps of the sequence and summarize them with one vector. And now you have different vectors describing every pair of steps in the sequence. And you can take those vectors summarizing little pieces of the sequence and update every, every neighboring pair of those vectors. And every time you do this, you shrink the length of the sequence by a factor of two. So you learn a way of summarizing two different vectors into one that you just recursively apply until you have a single vector describing the whole sequence that you saw. You can see how if you imagine that the input is something like a sequence of words, that this tree structure looks a little bit like a parse tree. And that's where these kinds of recursive networks are often applied. That you parse the input and then summarize the different nodes of the tree using vectors to capture everything that happens within each subtree. And you learn rules that map um, collections of vectors to single vectors summarizing the vectors that came below them. Um, so far, I've, I've repeatedly told you that everything about these recurrent networks is the same as what happens when we train a regular neural network, that it's still just a, a uh, forward propagation and a backward propagation. And it's true that the algorithms are the same. Uh, the place where we start to see things behave a little bit differently is what happens when we actually run these algorithms. And there are some ways that you could get into trouble with recurrent networks that you don't get into trouble with for regular networks. So on this graph, I'm plotting what happens when you build a neural net that looks at just one input variable that I draw on the x-axis of this graph. And it has uh, some hidden units that it uses to update an output variable. It feeds its output back into its input, and it just updates itself several different times. Uh, and I, I plot, um, as a function of x, what happens if you run different numbers of this update rule. Uh, on the blue curve, we get more or less just a straight line 
where we've run an update rule just once. And it's not a very interesting result. It's just a smooth straight line that's very easy to model. When we run it um, uh, twice, we actually get the dotted black line that starts to have some more structure to it. By the time we've run it five times, we've got the kind of greenish gold colored line that's really very jagged and wiggly. So the more times that we compose this function with itself, the more time steps that we apply to our recurrent nut, the, the more complicated the mapping from inputs to outputs that we get. And this means that we can start to get gradients that are uh, very, very large uh, in cases where we have large weights that we apply over and over again. We can also get gradients that are very, very small if we multiply something by a number near zero repeatedly. You can think of a recurrent network as being a lot like exponentiation of the weights connecting one time step to the next. So if we looked at a really, really simple recurrent net where we only have a visible unit x, we don't have any hidden units at all, and we don't have any activation functions, we just have a linear relationship from one time step to the next, then our rule would be x of t plus 1 is equal to w of t. Uh, w times t. So w is just a scalar, x is just a scalar. What happens if we run this for k different time steps? We get that the new value of x is the original value of x times w raised to the power of k. And so what happens with w raised to the power of k? If w is 1, then w raised to the power of k is still just 1. If w is greater than 1, we get an exponential explosion where w to the power of k is an extremely large number. And when we run our original input x through this model, we're always going to get a really huge number out at the output, regardless of whether the starting number was small or large, as, as long as it isn't like exact zero. Um, on the other hand, if w is less than 1, if w is like 0.9 or something, then w to the k is going to exponentially decay and we'll get smaller and smaller numbers over time. Um, that means that we'll either have gradients that go away and activations that shrink to zero, or we'll have gradients that explode and activations that explode. And it will make the network harder to train. We have some ways of dealing with both of those. Yeah. Don't you have a similar problem for feed-forward nets with multiple layers? So the question is, do you get the same problem with feed-forward nets that have multiple layers? Uh, there's a really good analysis of this by David Cicillo on the brain team. It's called random walk initialization. And the basic idea is that when you have multiple layers, you have a different value of W at every layer. Uh, and W is randomly sampled. So on some layers, you'll get a number that's larger than one. On other layers, you'll get a number that's smaller than one. When you multiply them all together, they kind of cancel out on average. And it turns out that you will gradually move away from the value that you start at, but you'll, it, it'll be kind of like the, it'll be proportional to the square root rather than proportional to an exponent. And it's relatively easy to adjust it to standard control. Uh, so so uh, feed forward nets don't seem to have this problem nearly as much. Um, one other thing to think about is what happens when you have a, a weight matrix, when you have multiple values that you're updating rather than a single value that you're updating. In that case, you have some vector x of t plus 1, and it's being updated from a vector x of t. And you have a weight matrix w now relating um, x of t and x of t plus 1. So what happens if you run it for multiple steps? It turns out that you multiply this w matrix by itself several times. And that's actually very similar, con similar conceptually to multiplying a scalar by itself several times. Instead of having a scalar w raised to the power of k, there's actually a concept of matrix exponentiation where you have a matrix w raised to the power of k. And it turns out that you can look at the eigenvalues of the matrix and those eigenvalues all get exponentiated. So if your matrix has an eigenvalue lambda, uh, that eigenvalue will get exponentiated, and you get the same kind of behavior that we saw looking at individual scalars. Um, eigenvalues that have values less than one will decay down to zero, and you'll lose track of inputs that are aligned with the direction of the corresponding eigenvalue. And eigenvalues that are greater than one 
will uh, explode, and inputs that are aligned with the corresponding eigenvalues will result in exponential explosion in the activations of the neural net. One way that we can deal with these vanishing and exploding gradients is to use addition to copy information from one time step to the next. Uh, the long short-term memory by Sepp Hochreiter and Jürgen Schmidt-Huber is the main example of how you do this. The actual update rule that you have is relatively complicated, and I'm not going to step through all of the different rules that we have, but the really key insight that makes this work well, in my opinion, is the idea that you can take the value at one time step and add a change to it in order to get the value at the next time step. This is a replacement for taking the value at one time step and multiplying by a matrix. And it means that your update rule from one time step to the next is very clean and simple and is less prone to exponential explosion. Uh, there's a lot of other variants of the LSTM that work pretty well uh, that you can use instead. There's also the gated recurrent unit, for example. And recently the brain team wrote a paper about using neural nets that design other neural nets, where they found a new kind of memory cell for updating the time step, for updating the memory at one time step given the previous one that performs slightly better than the LSTM on some tasks. But all of these have the same basic idea that you use addition over time so that the update rule is very simple and doesn't encounter as much of this exponential explosion problem. Yeah? Oh, oh, like, do you get a random walk wandering effect where the LSTM states uh, tend to travel proportional to the square root from their starting value? I actually haven't really thought through that. It, it seems plausible to me, though. Just at the level of intuition, it seems plausible. Um, yeah, you can, you can see this kind of random walk behavior in lots of systems that accumulate uh, random deviations over time. And the, the way that the system has to be set up for the random walk to happen is the different time steps have to be independent and the the mean of the deviation that you add has to be zero um, so if you if the deviation is on average greater than zero then you'll consistently walk in the positive direction but if you have a, a relatively symmetric random error then you'll you'll move proportional to the square root in distance away from where you started you, you can see this in, in a lot of ways that are pretty cool, like um, if you look at how inaccurate a clock is, uh, if the clock makes more or less random errors, then if you, like say you take an old mechanical clock and you synchronize it with a, an atomic clock, it'll start off with very little error, and then in the first day or two that you watch it, it'll accumulate a lot of error because it makes these random mistakes that bring it away from the atomic clock very quick. But then if you look at it like a month later, it won't have accumulated as much error as you might expect based on the first few days, because it follows this random walk square root pattern of, of making mistakes. That after one day, maybe it's added one second of error, but after 100 days, it's added 10 seconds. So one of the ways that we can deal with extremely large gradients in recurrent nets is using a technique called gradient clipping uh, that Razvan Pasganu advocated in an ICML paper a few years ago. The basic idea of gradient clipping is that when we make an update, we add some learning rate times the gradient to the parameters. And it's sometimes in a recurrent net, when we hit a very, very steep region where we get this exponential amplification of gradients, the gradient will be really, really big. So on the left, I show you this huge cliff that happens on a neural network loss function where the weights really combine exponentially and amplify the gradient a lot. You can see that um, if you watch the black dots showing where the parameters are on several different steps, we start up a little bit to the right of the cliff and we gradually move downhill. We're trying to fall into the seam connecting the valley to the bottom of the cliff. And ideally, we'd like to just find the lowest point of that seam and stop there, because that's where the, the cost function value is the lowest. What happens is, on the first several steps, we, uh, let me see if I can actually get the mouse moving. Uh, this mouse actually doesn't work very well, so I won't, I won't actually attempt that. But um, 
we start out toward the center of the plot, and we keep moving in little tiny steps leftward, moving slightly downhill, approaching this seam at the bottom of the cliff that we would like to fall into. And then catastrophe happens. We move just a little bit too far, and we land on the cliff way uphill, rather than going into the little tiny seam that we want to end in. So this could actually be recoverable. We could just take a little step back and end up more or less where we want to be. But that's not what gradient descent does on this problem. Gradient descent actually sees the gigantic gradient that comes from being on this extremely steep cliff face and takes a huge step where you go shooting way off the right of the plot and end up with a higher error function value than we started with. And we end up further away from the solution than we started out. If you use gradient clipping in the plot on the right, you see that when we come to the cliff, we go uphill a little bit, but then the gradient um, is automatically shrunk by this clipping rule. When we get really big gradients, we say that we believe in their direction, but we don't believe in their magnitude. So the gradient tells us to go back the way we came, uh, a distance of 10 units, we might say, well, we believe that the gradient is telling us to go back, but there's not any reason to really believe that 10 is the appropriate distance to go. And so we're going to travel, you know, 0.01 instead of 10. And then we move backwards in the direction we came, just a small amount, and we end up very close to the correct solution to this particular example. So mathematically, this can be thought of as an example of what's called a trust region method. Uh, the idea of a trust region method is that the gradient is giving you a linear approximation of the function that you're optimizing and very close to the point where you computed the gradient, that linear approximation is accurate. You can, you can trust that approximation. As you move further and further from the point where you computed the gradient, uh, then the linear approximation based on the gradient becomes less and less accurate. You've probably seen this in a calculus class about Taylor series, that a first order Taylor series is accurate really close to where you computed the derivative. And then you can make a second order Taylor series based on second derivatives, and it's accurate a little bit further out. And if you could keep adding more degrees to your Taylor polynomial, eventually it would be accurate uh, everywhere. But here we're only using one degree in our Taylor polynomial, so we can't actually believe the gradient for too far. So the gradient tells us some information. The gradient tells us how fast does the function decrease. And a lot of the time we can make faster progress in learning when we move faster when the function is going to decrease faster. But every now and then it's actually pretty misleading to believe that. Just because the ground is extremely steep doesn't mean that it will continue decreasing in a particular direction over a very long distance. And, and that's the information that gradient flipping adds to the, the gradient descent update role. One question. So, uh, does Adam or Kind of optimization yeah, so, so um, Adam and RMS prop are update rules that adjust the size of the gradient based on the size of previous gradients. And so they're actually pretty good at doing things like scaling down the gradient if you're seeing several large gradients in a row, or scaling up the gradient if you're seeing several small gradients in a row. So they do help a lot with the vanishing and exploding gradient problems that we get with recurrent neural nets. Um, gradient clipping is better for protecting you against a sudden surprise. Uh, so if you're using Atom or RMS prop and you've been seeing little tiny gradients for several steps, and then suddenly you see a huge one, you're actually still going to scale that one up. Um, so you may want to use both gradient clipping and Atom at the same time. I, I've, I've, I've done that before on some problems and it's worked pretty well for me. Yeah. Gradient clipping was originally advocated in the context of RNNs, and it's a lot more important for RNNs, but you can definitely use it for other kinds of models. I, I know that in, for example, the paper on FGANs, uh, they recommend using gradient clipping to make GAN training more stable, because the way that GANs are designed, sometimes they get really large gradients too. Uh, one especially exciting kind of recurrent network is a network that actually has explicit memory. So there's lots of different kinds of memory systems. Um, the memory that we have in the weights of a neural net 
is a lot like the kind of memory that we use in our brains to know how to perform tasks. So like when you, when you know how to ride a bike, that's very similar to the weights in a neural net. You practice riding the bike several times. Every time you ride the bike, you get a little bit better at it. And then eventually you know how to ride the bike. You're not very likely to forget in the far future, but you can't really quickly learn how to do something different and similar. Uh, like, like if you've been riding a bike for years, you can't just read a book and suddenly know how to do like BMX bikes tricks where you flip the bike upside down and things like that. You just don't gain the information that kind of way. So that kind of memory in neural networks doesn't seem to fully capture all the different things that we can do with our memories. Uh, if, if you get an email last week saying the reading group is at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, you don't need to run gradient descent on 10,000 instances of that email to learn its content. You don't need to sit there going, you know, reading group at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, reading group at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, reading group at 6.30 p.m. on Monday. You just remember it the first time you hear it. And that's very different than the way that we update our, um, our, our weights in a neural net. So networks that have explicit memory, like memory networks from Facebook or neural Turing machines from DeepMind, actually work by having a recurrent network that can control an explicit piece of memory. It's just, it's just a, a block of vectors that you can write to. So the way that you write to them is you add a value to that vector multiplied by a parameter in the neural net that determines how much you want to write to it. So we call that a gate. The gate can be between zero and one. When the gate is very close to zero, we don't really write much of anything to that particular memory cell. When the gate for a memory cell is close to one, we write a lot to it. You can also use the same mechanism to read out of memory cells. Uh, when the gate for a memory cell is close to one, you read a lot to it by multiplying the gate from that cell and adding it up to the values that you get from the other cells multiplied by the, their gates. Um, so like, let's say that we have uh, two different memory cells and we have one gate for each of them and we have a program that says it's going to use the first memory cell to store the time for the reading group and the second cell is going to store the time that you need to go to work tomorrow. Um, so you might get an email from your boss saying, um, you know, please come in a little bit early tomorrow uh, at, at 8.30 we have uh, a call with a client on the East Coast. Um, and so then when you read that, you can imagine that the neural net in your brain um, assigns a gating value of close to zero for the cell for the reading group and a gating value of close to one for the cell for the time you need to go to work. And then you have another piece of your neural net that reads this time 8.30 a.m. out of the email and sends that to the um, writing position of your network. So when you look at the cell for the reading group, you multiply uh, 8.30 a.m., uh, the vector representing 8.30 a.m. by a gate that's close to zero, and you end up with a vector that's very close to zero. So you add almost nothing to the slot telling you when the reading group is going to be. And then you look at the cell for what time you need to go to work tomorrow, you multiply a gate value that's close to one by this output value that's a vector representing the concept of 8.30 a.m. And you more or less just preserve this uh, 8.30 a.m. concept and you store it into that cell. A lot of the way that this has to work is you have to have a neural net that knows which cells mean which things and, and when to read from which cell and when to write to each cell. So if you uh, train a program to do things like read questions and answer them, it will start to work out its own internal system for how it's going to use each of the cells. Like if it reads lots of stories about people moving objects around, it will uh, learn to use different cells in its memory to represent the location of each object. And then when you ask it questions about where the objects are, it can read those locations back out of those positions. So if you read a story like Frodo took the ring to Mount Doom, it might write, you know, Mount Doom in one slot that represents the location of the ring. And when you ask it later, where, where is the ring? It would read the slot corresponding to the ring and tell you it's in Mount Doom. And that's, that's pretty nice because if you're able to copy those kinds of words into the memory cells, then you can handle sentences that use words you haven't really seen before. 
you could tell it that the you know, that, that the ring is in Mountain View, and even if it's only been trained on um, on Lord of the Rings that mentions imaginary locations, and then you give it a real location, it could store that text for the real location in an appropriate format of memory cell and recover it later. And so it's a really good way of dealing with words and concepts that aren't in the training data, but where it can uh, just store new symbols that it encounters at test time. Yeah. So people often refer to them as external memory, but really it's just uh, it's just a tensor in your graph. It's just a tensor that you can update by uh, you know multiplying and adding values to that to the previous time step version of that tensor. So you're really you're building like a big differentiable function representing the way the cells in a computer update over time, and in a real digital computer. You know, they, they update completely at every time step. Like you either write to a cell or you don't. You either read from a cell or you don't. For modern neural nets, we need to use gradient descent to train them. And so we actually need to have these soft values that can change an infinitesimal amount so that the gradient can understand the consequences of the choices that it makes. And you can learn to gradually write a little bit more to one cell or gradually write a little bit less to another cell. Yeah. Is it like we are encoding the uh, the address of the memory uh, somehow in the neural, net, neural network? Yeah, so the question is, are we encoding the address of the cell in the neural net? And there's actually a few different ways that you can do this. So one of them is called uh, address, or index-based addressing, I think is the term for it. And, and the idea there is you, you have a neural net that says basically, I want to update cell number five. And the way you do that is you have something like a softmax uh, where for every cell you have a different output value in the softmax and you just try to put uh, large values into the input of the softmax corresponding to the cell that you want to write to or read from. Um, another thing you can do is called uh, content-based addressing. And so that's especially useful. I, I don't work a lot with memory, so I might get this slightly wrong, but I think content-based addressing is especially useful if you want to read something. Um, so like, you know how a lot of the time you're trying to think of a song, and if somebody can tell you a little piece of the song, you can remember the rest of it? Uh, that's your human brain doing content-based addressing. That, uh, you know, if somebody tells you the title of the song, maybe you have no idea what they're talking about, but they sing a few words of it, and suddenly you can fill in the rest of the sequence. Uh, so the way that content-based addressing works in a neural net is you have a softmax over all the different memory positions, and the input to the softmax at each memory position is given by something like the mean squared error between um, the value that is actually stored in the cell right now and your prediction of some value that you're looking for. Uh, so the neural net might say, okay, here's an output value that, that's kind of something like what I'm looking for. It's like, we're all in uh, some kind of submarine, and then the neural net compares that to all the different songs in its memory. And somewhere in there, there's Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. You know, we all live in a yellow submarine. And it's like, oh, cool, like five of those words match. And so you'll end up with a much lower mean squared error at that cell than the others. So then you run the softmax of the negative mean squared errors, and you get a really uh, big value of the softmax for that particular song. And then you read that memory cell, and you get the entire uh, value of the song out, even though you put like a bad, corrupted, in incomplete version of the song in the input. Um, and, and for different kinds of programs, you may want to do different kinds of things. Like I think if you're doing something like sorting numbers, you probably don't want to do content-based addressing as much as just have a program that knows which slot you're going to write to next. Whereas if you're trying to do things like um, fill in, in gaps in an image or a piece of text, you probably want to use content-based addressing to figure out which part of the text you should be looking at to be relevant to some particular idea. Uh, so this uh, memory networks and neural Turing machines are the most advanced recurrent that, that we cover in this chapter. Uh, so that's everything for tonight.
I'm still available for questions if you have more questions. Yeah, you can think of, the question is, I haven't really mentioned attention mechanisms. Um, you can think of the attention mechanism as being the, the softmax that you use to determine uh, which cells to read from and which cells to write to. So I've described an attention mechanism in terms of uh, controlling access to memory cells, but you could also use attention mechanisms to access other kinds of information. Like if you have a, a sentence, you can use an attention mechanism to access a particular word in the sentence, or you can look another layer up and access a particular word embedding uh, from the input sequence and, and so on. Um, there's other kinds of attention mechanisms that are a little bit less similar to the ones that you see for memory cells, like some of the attention mechanisms that people use in vision uh, work somewhat differently than these, but it's still kind of the same basic idea of using one part of the neural net to explain how to read from a particular location in, in a somewhat differentiable way. Is 16-bit floating point good enough to train a RNN, or do you sometimes need 32-bit floating point? Uh, the question is, is 16-bit floating point good enough to train an RNN? And I actually don't know. Um, my guess is that it probably matters a little bit more for some values than for others. Uh, like like the state units might require more precision than the weights if you need to backpropagate through several layers of state. But that's really just a guess. I don't actually work in that area very much myself. Uh, I pretty much never use anything less than float 32 because I'm always, I'm, I'm a researcher. I have the luxury of always using a big GPU farm and I don't need to worry about making things run on mobile phones or anything like that most of the time. Yeah, the question is for backpropagation through time, does it need to be a fixed number of time steps? And the answer is uh, every time you have a different sequence, you can just unroll for a different number of steps. Uh, a lot of the time when you implement these values in software, you might find that you want to use a mini batch of several different sequences in one mini batch. And not every sequence in your mini batch will be the same length. So that might mean that if you have a mini batch that has two different sentences in it and one of them is five words long and the other one is 10 words long, you might end up zeroing out all the values for the last five time steps of the shorter sequence. And then you're wasting some effort back propagating nothing through several time steps of that part of the mini batch. But overall, it can be worthwhile to uh, have the GPU running all these operations in parallel. That, that can be that could be more uh, that, that that can be more efficient than trying to do branching and have different parts of the GPU running different instructions. Are there any models designed for dealing with sequences where there's some type of rep repetition? I'm thinking of like sound waves or radio waves, um, where there's like some underlying structure structure to the sequence other than. Um, so you're wondering about models that have really strong periodicity and then like sine waves and things like exactly. that. Yeah, um, I don't know a lot about that kind of work. Uh, recurrent nets are general enough that they can express that, but if you know that there's a kind of periodicity there that uh, the model would have to discover on its own, you could make it generalize a lot faster by building something into the model that would help it find that. Um, so like one thing you could do is actually just like add sine waves to the input values it can concatenate them on, and then it can learn about the correlation between the sine waves that you've put in and the values that it's trying to predict. Um, I guess that's, that's easier if you know the time scale. You could also imagine, if you don't know the time scale, you could imagine having like differentiable input units where uh, they're driven by a learned time scale parameter that the neural net can adapt. And then it would be able to adjust the time scale parameter to make that feature be more predictive of the outputs you're trying to predict. I, I don't know how all that would work off the top of my head, but it's it's like a straightforward way of getting a differentiable model that has uh, the information that this kind of wave is a useful thing to be thinking about and build into it. Yeah. 
you mentioned the compatriots versus Americans example. How do you deal with solving that in practice since you know that seems a bit black box? Oh yeah, so the question is if you have a bunch of training data where uh, like like my compatriots is always translated as my fellow Americans, how do you deal with that? Uh, one way is to get a, a wider set of training data. Um, I think that's the main strategy that people use. I don't actually work in machine translation myself, so I'm not entirely sure what the best solution people have, have come up with is. Um, a lot of different regularization techniques can also help you out there. But if your data just like really consistently shows the wrong answer, then it, it seems hard to me to fix it by any other way than getting better data. Construct uh, belief nets using RNNs. Uh, belief nets? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the question is, can you construct belief nets using RNNs? Um, a lot of the time, we use belief net to refer to a Bayesian network, where we represent conditional probabilities given other conditional probabilities. And you can definitely use recurrent nets and Bayesian networks together. Usually, when we say recurrent network, we're thinking of something that's deterministic and continuous and differentiable. Um, if you look at the mean field equations for estimating the expe expected value of different units in a Bayesian network, then those mean field equations define a recurrent net. Uh, and I, I wrote a paper called Multi-Prediction Defaults in Machines, where I just train a recurrent net that does mean field, and I train it to be good at mean field estimation, rather than training the model based on likelihood or something like that. And then that idea is based on a few other people that worked with other kinds of graphical models. I was working with a graphical model called a Bolton machine. Some people publishing earlier than me worked on things like uh, just uh, other kinds of Markov random fields. If, if you look at the citations in the multi-prediction deep Bolton machine, I, paper I point to a few of those. You could also imagine making like a stochastic recurrent network uh, where you don't actually have continuous deterministic differentiable values, but you could have like binary values that you randomly sample. Mm -hmm. And if you have one binary value that you randomly sample and then it influences its future state, you could think of that as a kind of stochastic recurrent net. But you could also just say that's a Markov chain. Um, and so things like, like Gibbs sampling in a graphical model you can think of it as being a stochastic recurrent network, or you can think of it as being a Markov chain. And they're, they're both kind of the same thing. Um, the interesting thing is that they, they hint at different ways of training that model. Like if you think of it as a graphical model represented by a Markov chain, you want to influence its equilibrium distribution. Uh, and if you think of it as a stochastic recurrent net, you want to run backprop through time through a specific number of steps that may not have actually reached equilibrium. Um, and so one gives you this very nice analytical way of controlling the equilibrium distribution of the having to back propagate through every step. But a lot of the time, uh, that analysis doesn't translate into very good approximations in practice. And then the other one gives you uh, this kind of expensive and ugly multi-step graph that you've got to propagate through. But it might, in practice, give you uh, better behaved gradients than if you're uh, trying to reach equilibrium and not actually getting there. I'm not sure if a lot of that made made a lot of sense to you or not, but yeah, um, I, I need to read your paper. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about batch normalization and some of the recommendations as to where you should and shouldn't apply it? Uh, yeah. So, so the the thing about batch normalization is you want to make the statistics of the network look the same at. at uh, every different layer and when you update the parameters you'd like to have there still be different places that have zero mean and unit standard deviation. For recurrent nets because you have many different views of the same underlying variable at different time steps it can be a little bit confusing about whether you want to look at um, h of t and h of t plus one and h of t plus two and group all those together and batch normalize them and if so, like how do you even do that? Because how do you compute h of t plus one if you haven't been able to batch normalize h of t yet because your normalization for h of t depends on h of t plus two? So to get out of those kinds of tail, tail chasing conundrums, uh, people have used other techniques like layer normalization. So instead of trying to look at uh, a whole 
batch of data and all the different time steps of the sequence when you update a particular layer of the recurrent net, you make it so that all the activation values in that time step have mean zero and standard deviation one, but you're taking that mean across different hidden units rather than across different instances of the same hidden unit. Uh, the paper there is just called uh, layer normalization, and, and that could give you a lot more information than I know off the top of my head. I think the upshot is that they tried out layer normalization and it worked pretty well on a lot of tasks. Uh, and, and so I would, I would probably recommend it. I mostly work with feed forward nets, uh, uh, but batch normalization makes a really big difference there. So I'd expect that a layer normalization makes a really big difference for recurrent nets. Um, so I'm uh, curious about the So I guess the question is about predicting user data a year in the future. And there are a lot of things that are difficult about long-term predictions. Some of these things come from the structure of the recurrent net, and some of them come from the nature of the prediction task itself. Um, so if you have a recurrent net that you want to run for several steps, you have the problem that you've got to backpropagate through all those steps. That takes a lot of memory. It also means that a lot of unfortunate things can happen to your gradients along the way, they can vanish or explode. Uh, and then a completely separate source of difficulty is that a lot of things can change in the real world when a lot of time passes. And that the more time that passes, the more uncertainty creeps in and, and the more stochasticity there is. Uh, like like if, if you were in 2016 trying to predict what the world would be like in 2017, most people back then predicted that Hillary Clinton would win the election, and basically all of our predictions for the state of things involving the U.S. government look totally different than they look now with the information we have about Donald Trump winning. Um, and that has nothing to do with the structure of recurrent networks. That's, that's more of just the nature of reality is that uh, larger changes can happen as larger amounts of time pass. One way that you can do long-term predictions of things like what user data will look like a year from now and suffer only the second kind of difficulty is you can actually just skip time steps. You could make a feed forward network that takes uh, data from time one and predicts data that you gathered at time two and you can make the gap between time one and time two as, as large as you want. Uh, now if you want to fill in everything that happens in between then you do have to use a recurrent net. Um, and so let's say you want to have a recurrent net that fills in everything that happens between time one and time 100, but you'd still like it to capture really strong correlations between time step one and time step 90 without relying only on the single update rule from time step one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on to propagate that information. You can make time steps that run at different scales. So you can have one set of hidden units that leap ahead and influence uh, an, an instance of themselves that happens 10 time steps later, and uh, then still have other hidden units that update themselves one time step further in the future. And so these different time scales, uh, some of them are really good at capturing fine-grained detail about how things change from one moment to the next. The others are really good at storing information, propagating it farther forward, and helping the network to remember things for a very long time. There used to be a lot of work on these models that has several different time scales. I think today it's not quite as popular of an area. It might just be that I'm not paying attention to the literature as well as I should, but I think today a lot of tasks people are just um, making the recurrent network that has a nice LSTM or, or GRU activation function and using a good optimizer like Atom with gradient flipping and hoping for the best. A lot of the time we see that people spend a lot of time trying to design really nice 
uh, models that, that have like hand design properties, and then it turns out that if we just make the model really easy to optimize, the optimizer takes care of it for us. How much context should you give to make a prediction? Yeah, if you like say you have a sequence that goes like multiple years back, but you only want to predict like uh, the next couple of steps. I guess it depends a lot on the task, uh, but for a lot of tests, you don't need to look very far back. Like if you look at things like the reinforcement le learning agents for playing Atari games, you can play better than human on a lot of Atari games, even if you only look at at like I think like four frames, uh, and and so you you're really just seeing enough frames to estimate the velocity of different objects and things like that, and that's all the more that your reinforcement learning controller needs to know. Uh, some other tasks I could imagine you might need to integrate information from the very distant past, and then, then everything gets a lot more difficult. Uh, one piece of advice I have is if you read chapter 11, I, I, I copy some advice from Andrew Eng, which is to build an end-to-end -end system as early as possible, and then start uh, looking for the failures of that system. Run specific tests that tell you specific actions to take to upgrade them. So you could start off by having a recurrent net that doesn't get a lot of context and see how well it performs. And then try adding a little bit more context and see if that helps you or not. And if, if you don't seem to be gaining ground by adding more context, then maybe don't invest a lot of effort in building extremely long confidence or extremely long recurrent heads that use lots and lots of context. So uh, repeating the question for the mic that I'm a little bit closer to, uh, the question is, do recurrent nets resist adversarial examples better than other kinds of models? Uh, is, is it harder to fool a recurrent net into making a wrong prediction by making very small changes to its input? Uh, so far, it seems like the answer is uh, probably no, that, that most recurrent nets that we've tested are not actually better. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a difficulty with making apples to apples comparisons because a lot of the recurrent nets that we use, we use for different tasks than feed forward nets. You know, like if we're going to read an English sentence and produce a French sentence, we use a recurrent net. If we look at an image and tell you whether it's a panda or a truck, we use a convolutional net. Uh, you can make some kinds of apples to apples comparisons by actually having recurrent nets that look at images and tell you what the image is. So you can uh, load an input image and then have a hidden unit representation of the image that influences itself, where you repeatedly update the estimate of the hidden units given the previous estimate. Um, you know, there's a lot of different recurrent nets that work like that. Uh, you were asking about graphical models earlier. One way to get one of these recurrent models for recognizing images is to have a graphical model where you keep updating your estimate of the latent variables to become more and more accurate. And so far I haven't found that that is more robust to adversarial examples than other kinds. Um, you can actually see that I wrote a paper called Explaining and Harnessing Adversarial Examples. Sort of buried toward the end of the paper, we briefly describe an experiment where we take the recurrent net that computes uh, mean field expectations in a deep Boltzmann machine, and we tested that on adversarial examples and it didn't really perform any better than a normal classifier. Uh, since then, I've tried out some other recurrent nets and I haven't published those experiments because they all had the same negative result. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What are some of the pros and cons of RNNs versus CNNs for natural language processing? Yeah, uh, the question is, what are the pros and cons of RNNs and CNNs for natural language processing? 
I, I'm not a huge natural language processing expert, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, but um, convolutional nets can usually come close to recurrent nets in terms of their performance on tasks like translation or sentiment analysis. Like if you look at the table of state-of-the-art results in natural language processing papers, usually you'll find some kind of recurrent net is at the bottom with the lowest error, but maybe one or two rows on the table above it, there'll be some kind of convolutional net. Uh, I'm not following those particular horse races really, really closely. I, what I can tell you is that convolutional nets and recurrent nets are actually pretty closely related. You can actually think of every recurrent net as having a convolutional net hiding inside of it. Um, so the convolutional net has a connection from an input to a hidden unit. And inputs that are close to hidden units in space are connected to each other. Inputs that are not close to each other in space are not connected. Uh, I don't have a whiteboard or anything, do I? You do. Um, yeah. Um, there's a marker. Can we erase this? Um, yeah. Oh, oh, the wall is a whiteboard. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, so let's say we have a bunch of inputs like this. And let's say we have a convolution kernel with width 1. So it's just going to connect one pixel to the hidden unit that's the closest to it. When you do that, you get each input going to a hidden unit that's right next to it in space. So that's, that's convolution. That's a really simple version of convolution. Uh, I'll draw arrows so you see which way the information is flowing. Um, so what's a recurrent net? Uh, a recurrent net is at every time step, the input gets to update the hidden unit, and the hidden unit gets to update the next time step hidden unit. So what happens when we actually unroll that and draw it for a few steps? We actually end up with uh, all the edges from the convolutional net inside our recurrent net. Um, the difference between them is the recurrent net has these sideways edges. So a recurrent net is like a convolutional net where the hidden units get to influence each other. And looking at it another way, a convolutional net is like a recurrent net where uh, the input gets to influence the hidden units, but, and, and that's the end of it. So in terms of the implications for optimizing this model, um, you've got to run backprop through time on the recurrent net. You've got to actually start here, trace your way back, and back and back through the recurrent net. And that adds a lot of computational difficulty and, and some numerical difficulties from the gradients vanishing or exploding. Uh, the vanishing gradients aren't as big of a problem as the exploding ones a lot of the time, uh, as long as the recurrent net, as long as the convolutional net connections that don't have the vanishing problem can, can solve it on their own. Um, and so that's that's why if you're interested in training really fast or training without very much memory, uh, the convolutional net can perform nearly as well as the recurrent net. And if it's, if it's worth it to you to have that reduced resource usage, it can be a good trade-off to make. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the question is about something that's not all that related to chapter 10. I'll go ahead and answer it anyway. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I, I work on a team at Google that studies machine learning security. We're running a contest right now on Kaggle.com for people to upload models that try to fool each other. You can enter either as an attacker or as a defender. If you are an attacker, you try to fool other people's models. If you're a defender, you try to classify inputs correctly even though people have changed them slightly trying to fool your model. And the question is, what, what are some of the best attacks and some of the best defenses that you could use? Uh, for defenses, we don't know a whole lot that works very well yet. Uh, there's a recent paper by Alexander Madry at, at MIT where he says that training on lots of adversarial examples that were generated starting from random starting points is a pretty good defense. And that seems like something to focus your attention on. Um, as far as I know, no one has been able to break his model on MNIST yet. But 
it's not clear whether his strategy will scale up to ImageNet, and the contest is on ImageNet. On the attack side, one of the best attack algorithms right now is the one from a paper by Nicholas Carlini and uh, David Wagner, where basically they use Atom and run Atom for several steps to maximize the error that the neural net will incur. And that's a really good attack if you have access to the weights. Um, then there's the problem that in this contest you actually don't have access to the weights of the model you're trying to confuse. So the, the best attack there is from a paper called Delving into Transferable Adversarial Examples from Don Song's lab at Berkeley. And the idea there is to make a very large ensemble of different models and find an adversarial example that fools all of them. And because it's fooled so many different models, it's very likely to fool any other model that the defender might be using. Um, I guess a lot of other people in the contest are going to know about this too because I'm, I'm giving the same advice to everyone. I'm just summarizing the state of the literature right now. But those are the attack and defense papers that seem to be the state of the art right now to me. And they'd be where I would start if I were competing in this contest. Right. It looks like that might be all of our chapter 10 questions. Just one uh, general question about the book. Yeah. Is there, I know there's um, different translations that are coming up, uh, but is there like a second edition? Are you working on like a, like a, like a follow or like, a, I don't know, anything or a companion guide or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so th the, the book has been translated by a few different publishers. The way it works is we sold the rights to MIT Press. MIT Press can also sell rights to publish in specific markets to other publishers. Um, publishers around the world have been responsible for buying the rights and making the translation themselves. I, I know that a Russian translation just came out, a Chinese translation just came out. I'm not actually sure which publishers are doing which other languages. Off the top of my head, I could poke around and find out if people are curious. Uh, at the moment, none of us is actually working on a second edition yet. We may at some point. If you look at other academic books, it's been something like eight years since uh, the, the previous edition of AI A Modern Approach came out. Uh, all of us have multiple jobs uh, and it makes it hard to do something like sit down and just write a book for the number of years that it took to make this one. Uh, there are other books about deep learning coming out and so we'll probably see several different books from different authors kind of leapfrogging each other in terms of which one is the most up-to-date and every few years we'll get a different one that's newer. Um, to some extent, I'm already doing that with this book, or Yoshua and Aaron and I are already doing that with this book. You can think of it as something like an update on the state of the most popular machine learning algorithms right now. If you view maybe Kevin Murphy's book as an example of a previous machine learning book that caught you up on the previous wave of popular machine learning algorithms. Um, it's also possible maybe something will replace deep learning entirely, you know, maybe uh, maybe, maybe there'll be a completely different book that everyone wants an update of next year. Uh, uh, we do, we, we are hopefully going to add more exercises for the book that uh, Aaron is working on that now. And uh, we will also release a lot of typo fixes. Uh, there was a silent update to the website a while ago. Uh, MIT Press actually edited the book and found a lot of typos in our original manuscript. Mm -hmm. So the website was serving the original manuscript for a long time. We recently had uh, a, a student or a contractor at University of Montreal incorporate all the feedback from MIT Press into the web version, but we have not yet incorporated all of the reader feedback since the book launched. Uh, until we did this incorporation of the feedback from MIT Press, we didn't have the two versions in agreement with each other, so we couldn't edit either version. And now they're in agreement, but we've been too busy to update the typos. I'll hopefully do it in the next few weeks. Cool. Thanks. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for inviting me.